Contemplations by Anne Bradstreet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Some time now passed in the autumnal tide, when Phoebus wanted but one hour to bed. The trees, all richly clad, yet void of pride, were gilded o'er by his rich golden head. Their leaves and fruits seemed painted, but was true, of green, of red, of yellow, mixed hue. Wrapped were my senses at this delectable view. I wist not what to wish, yet sure, thought I, if so much excellence abide below, how excellent is he that dwells on high, whose power and beauty by his works we know. Sure he is goodness, wisdom, glory, light, that hath this underworld so richly dight. More heaven than earth was here, no winter and no night. Then on a stately oak I cast mine eye, whose ruffling top the clouds seemed to aspire. How long since thou wast in thine infancy, thy strength and stature, more thy years admire. Hath hundred winters passed since thou wast born, or thousand since thou breakest thy shell of horn? If so, all these are not eternity doth scorn. I heard the merry grasshopper then sing, the black-clad cricket bear a second part. They kept one tune and played on the same string, seeming to glory in their little art. Shall creatures object thus their voices raise, and in their kind resound their master's praise, whilst I, as mute, can warble forth no higher lays? When I behold the heavens, as in their prime, and then the earth, though old, still clad in green, the stones and trees insensible of time, nor age nor wrinkle on their front are seen. If winter come, and greenness then do fade, a spring returns, and they more youthful made. But man grows old, lies down, remains where once he's laid. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. To a lady on her remarkable preservation in a hurricane in North Carolina by Phyllis Wheatley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Though thou didst hear the tempest from afar, and feltest the horrors of the watery war. To me unknown, yet on this peaceful shore, methinks I hear the storm tumultuous roar. And how stern Boreas, with impetuous hand, compelled the Nereids to usurp the land. Reluctant rose the daughters of the main, and slow ascending glided o'er the plain. Till Aeolus in his rapid chariot drove, in gloomy grandeur from the vault above. Furious he comes. His winged sons obey. Their frantic sire and madden all the sea. The billows rave. The wind's fierce tyrant roars. And with his thundering terrors shakes the shores. Broken by waves, the vessel's frame is rent. And strows with planks the watery element. But thee, Maria, a kind Nered's shield, preserved from sinking, and thy form upheld, and sure some heavenly oracle designed, at that dread crisis to instruct thy mind, things of eternal consequence to weigh, and to thine heart just feelings to convey, of things above, and of the future doom, and what the births of the dread world to come. From tossing seas I welcome thee to land. Resign her, Nered, "'Twas thy God's command. "'Thy spouse, late buried, as thy fears conceived, "'again returns. "'Thy fears are all relieved. "'Thy daughter blooming with superior grace, "'again thou seest, again thine arms embrace. "'O come, and joyful, 
show thy spouse his heir, and with the blessings of maternal care. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Star Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. O oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? or the land of the free, and the home of the brave. On the shore dimly seen, through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes, what is that which the breeze o'er the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, now conceals, now discloses? Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected, now shines on the stream, "'Tis the star-spangled banner, O oh, long may it wave, O'er the land of the free, And the home of the brave. "'And where is that band Who so vauntingly swore That the havoc of war And the battle's confusion, A home and a country, Should leave us no more? The blood has washed out Their foul footsteps' pollution. No refuge could save The hireling and slave From the terror of flight And the gloom of the grave.' And the star-spangled banner and triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. O oh, thus be it ever, when freemen shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must for our cause; it is just, and this be our motto. And God is our trust, and the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Home Sweet Home by John Howard Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. A charm from the skies seems to hallow us there, Which, seek through the world, is ne'er met with elsewhere. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, There's no place like home, there's no place like home. An exile from home, Splendor dazzles in vain. Oh, give me my lowly thatched cottage again. The birds singing gaily that came at my call. Give me them, and the peace of mind, dearer than all. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. How sweet tis to sit neath a fond father's smile, And the cares of a mother to soothe and beguile. Let others delight mid new pleasures to roam, But give me, oh, give me, the pleasures of home. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, There's no place like home, there's no place like home. To thee I'll return, overburdened with care, The heart's dearest solace will smile on me there. No more from that cottage again will I roam, Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wild Honeysuckle by Philip M. Freno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
Reading by Bologna Times. Fair flower, that dost so comely grow, hid in this silent dull retreat, untouched thy homed blossoms blow, unseen thy little branches greet, no roving foot shall crush thee here, no busy hand provoke a tear. By nature's self, in white arrayed, she bade thee shun the vulgar eye, and planted here the guardian shade, and sent soft waters murmuring by. Thus quietly thy summer goes, thy days declining to repose. Smit with those charms that must decay, I grieve to see your future doom. They died, nor were those flowers more gay, the flowers that did in Eden bloom. Unpitying frosts, and autumn's power, shall leave no vestige of this flower. From morning suns and evening dews, at first thy little being came. If nothing wants, you nothing lose. For when you die, you are the same. The space between is but an hour, the frail duration of a flower. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thanatopsis by William Cullen Bryant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks a various language. For his gayer hours she has a voice of gladness and a smile and eloquence of beauty and she glides into his darker musings with a mild and healing sympathy that steals away their sharpness ere he is aware. When thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over thy spirit, and sad images of the stern agony, and shroud and pall, and breathless darkness, and the narrow house, make thee to shudder and grow sick at heart, go forth under the open sky, and list to nature's teachings, while from all around, earth and her waters, and the depths of air, comes a still voice. Yet a few days, and thee, the all-beholding sun, shall see no more in all his course, nor yet in the cold ground, where thy pale form was laid with many tears, nor in the embrace of ocean, shall exist thy image earth that nourished thee shall claim thy growth to be resolved to earth again and lost each human trace surrendering up thine individual being shalt thou go to mix forever with the elements to be a brother to the insensible rock and to the sluggish clod which the rude swain turns with his share and treads upon the oak shall send his roots abroad and pierce thy mould Yet not to thine eternal resting place shalt thou retire alone, nor couldst thou wish couch more magnificent. Thou shalt lie down with patriarchs of the infant world, with kings, the powerful of the earth, the wise, the good, fair forms, and hoary seers of ages past, all in one mighty sepulchre. The hills, rock-ribbed and ancient as the sun, the vales stretching in a pensive quietness between, the venerable woods, rivers that move in majesty, and the complaining brooks that make the meadows green, and poured round all, old ocean's gray and melancholy waste, are but the solemn decorations all of the great tomb of man. The golden sun, the planets, all the infinite host of heaven, are shining on the sad abodes of death through the still lapse of ages. All that tread the globe are but a handful to the tribes that slumber in its bosom. Take the wings of morning, pierce the bark and wilderness, or lose thyself in the continuous woods where rolls the Oregon and hears no sound, save his own dashing. Yet the dead are there, and millions in those solitudes since first the flight of years began, have laid them down in their last sleep, 
the dead reign there alone. So shalt thou rest, and what if thou withdraw in silence from the living, and no friend take note of thy departure? All that breathe will share thy destiny. The gay will laugh when thou art gone. The solemn brood of care plod on, and each one as before will chase his favorite phantom. Yet all these shall leave their mirth and their employments, and shall come and make their bed with thee. As the long train of ages glides away, the sons of men, the youth in life's green spring, and he who goes in the full strength of years, matron and maid, the speechless babe and the gray-headed man, shall one by one be gathered to thy side, by those who in their turn shall follow them. So live, that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm, where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death, thou go not, like the quarry slave at night, scourged to his dungeon, but, sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him, and lies down to pleasant dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Village Blacksmith by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Under a spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, a mighty man, is he, with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. His hair is crisp and black and long, his face is like the tan, his brow is wet with honest sweat, he earns whate'er he can, and looks the whole world in the face, for he owes not any man. Week in, week out, from morn till night, you can hear his bellows blow, you can hear him swing his heavy sledge with measured beat and slow, like a sexton ringing the village bell, when the evening sun is low. And children coming home from school look in at the open door. They love to see the flaming forge and hear the bellows roar, and catch the burning sparks that fly like chaff from a threshing floor. He goes on Sunday to the church and sits among his boys. He hears the parson pray and preach. He hears his daughter's voice. Singing in the village choir, and it makes his heart rejoice. It sounds to him like her mother's voice, singing in paradise. He needs must think of her once more, how in the grave she lies, and with his hard rough hand he wipe a tear out of his eyes. Toiling, rejoicing, sorrowing, onward through life he goes. Each morning sees some task begin, each evening sees it close. Something attempted, something done, has earned a night's repose. Thanks, thanks to thee, my worthy friend, for the lesson thou hast taught. Thus at the flaming forge of life our fortunes must be wrought. Thus on its sounding anvil shaped each burning deed and thought. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seed Time and Harvest by John Greenleaf Whittier This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times As o'er his furrowed fields which lie Beneath a coldly dropping sky, Yet chill with winter's melted snow The husbandman goes forth to sow. Thus freedom on the bitter blast, The ventures of thy seed we cast, and trust to warmer sun and rain, To swell the germ and fill the grain. Who calls thy glorious service hard? Who deems it not its own reward? Who, for its trials, counts it less? A cause of praise and thankfulness. 
It may not be our lot to wield the sickle in the ripened field, nor ours to hear on summer eves the reaper's song among the sheaves. Yet where our duty's task is wrought, in unison with God's great thought, the near and future blend in one, and whatsoe'er is willed is done. And ours the grateful service whence comes, day by day the recompense, the hope, the trust, the purpose stayed, the fountain and the noonday shade. And were this life the utmost span, the only end and aim of man, better the toil of fields like these than waking dream and slothful ease. But life, though falling like our grain, like that revives and springs again, and early called, how blessed are they, who wait in heaven their harvest day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Snowstorm by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Announced by all the trumpets of the sky, arrives the snow, and driving o'er the fields, seems nowhere to alight. The whited air hides hills and woods, the river and the heaven, and veils the farmhouse at the garden's end. The sled and traveller stopped, the courier's feet delayed, all friends shut out, the housemates sit around the radiant fireplace, enclosed in a tumultuous privacy of storm. Come and see the north wind's masonry, out of an unseen quarry evermore, furnished with tile, the fierce artificer curves his white bastions with projected roof round every windward stake, or tree, or door, speeding the myriad-handed, his wild work so fanciful, so savage, not cares he for number or proportion. Mockingly, on coop or kennel, he hangs pariah wreaths. A swan-like form invests the hidden thorn, fills up the farmer's lane from wall to wall, Mauger the farmer's size, and at the gate a tapering turret overtops the work, and when his hours are numbered, and the world is all his own, retiring, as he were not, leaves, when the sun appears, astonished art to mimic in slow structures, stone by stone, built in an age, the mad wind's night-work, the frolic architecture of the snow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Vain by Emily Dickinson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times I cannot live with you. It would be life, and life is over there behind the shelf. The sexton keeps the key too, putting up our life, his porcelain, like a cup, discarded of the housewife, quaint or broken, a newer severus pleases, old ones crack. I could not die with you, for one must wait to shut the other's gaze down. You could not. And I, could I stand by and see you freeze, without my right of frost, death's privilege? Now could I rise with you, because your face would put out Jesus, that new grace, grow plain and foreign on my homesick eye, except that you, then he, shone closer by. They judge us, how? For you served heaven, you know, or sought to, I could not. Because you saturated sight, and I had no more eyes for sordid excellence as paradise, and were you lost, I would be though my name rang loudest on the heavenly fame. And were you saved, and I condemned to be, where you were not, that self were hell to me. So we must keep apart, you there, I here, with just the door ajar, that oceans are, and prayer, and that pale sustenance, despair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Woodman, Spare That Tree by George P. Morris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Woodman, spare that tree. Touch not a single bough. In youth it sheltered me, and I'll protect it now. Twas my forefather's hand that placed it near his cot. There, woodman, let it stand. Thy axe shall harm it not. That old familiar tree, whose glory and renown are spread o'er land and sea, and wouldst thou hew it down? Woodman, forbear thy stroke. Cut not its earth-bound ties. O oh, spare that aged oak, now towering to the skies. When but an idle boy I sought its grateful shade, and all their gushing joy, here too my sisters played. My mother kissed me here, my father pressed my hand. Forgive this foolish tear, but let that old oak stand. My heart-strings round thee cling, close as thy bark, old friend. Here shall the wild bird sing, and still thy branches bend. Old tree, the storm still brave, and woodman, leave the spot, while I've a hand to save. Thy axe shall harm it not. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring by Eliza Paul Kirkbride Gurney. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Oh, the world looks glad, for the spring has smiled, and the birds are come with their wood notes wild, and the waters leap with a joyous sound, like freedom's voice when a chain's unbound. And soon with its bloom will the earth be gay, for the air is bland as the breath of May. Sunshine and buds and all glorious things will give to the hours their downiest wings. Nature has burst from her wintry tomb, wreathed with the glory of brightening bloom. Fetters of frostwork are gently unbound, blossoms and flowers are clustering round. Bosoms that know not the blighting of care, sunshine and gladness may smilingly wear. But for the broken and desolate heart, springtime at last has no balm to impart. Tones that are hushed it awakens no more, friends that are gone it can never restore. Yet e'en to the mourner one hope it may bring, tis the type of eternity's glorious spring. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lenore by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Ah, broken is the golden bowl, the spirit flown forever. Let the bell toll, a saintly soul floats on the Stygian river. And, Guidevere, hast thou no tear? Weep now or never more. See, on yon drear and rigid bier, low lies thy love, Lenore. Come, let the burial rite be read, the funeral song be sung, an anthem for the queenliest dead that ever died so young. A dirge for her, the doubly dead, and that she died so young. Wretches, ye loved her for her wealth, and hated her for her pride, and when she fell in feeble health, ye blessed her that she died. How shall the ritual then be read, the requiem how be sung, by you, by yours the evil eye, by yours the slanderous tongue, that did to death the innocence that died and died so young? Picavimus, but rave not thus, and let a Sabbath song go up to God so solemnly the dead may feel no wrong. The sweet Lenore hath gone before, with hope that flew beside, leaving thee wild for the dear child that should have been thy bride. For her, the fair and debonair, that now so lowly lies, the life upon her yellow hair, but not within her eyes. 
the life still there, upon her hair, the death upon her eyes. Avaunt, to-night my heart is light, no dirge will I upraise, but waft the angel on her flight with a pain of old days. Let no bell toll, lest her sweet soul, amid its hallowed mirth, should catch the note as it doth float above the damned earth. To friends above, from fiends below, the indignant ghost is riven. From hell unto a high estate, far up within the heaven. From grief and groan to a golden throne, beside the king of heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mockingbird by Sidney Lanier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Superb and sole upon a plumed spray that o'er the general leafage boldly grew, he summed the woods in song, or typic drew. The watch of hungry hawks, the lone dismay of languid doves, when long their lovers stray, and all birds' passion plays that sprinkle dew at morn in brake or bosky avenue. What e'er birds did or dreamed, this bird could say. Then down he shot, bounced airily along the sward, twitched in a grasshopper, made song mid flight, perched, prinked, and to his art again. Sweet science! This large riddle read me plain. How may the death of that dull insect be, The life of yon trim Shakespeare on the tree? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Path That Leads to Home By Edgar A. Guest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times The little path that leads to home, this is the road for me. I know no finer path to roam, with finer sights to see. With thoroughfares the world is lined, that lead to wonders new. But he who treads them leaves behind the tender things and true. O oh, north and south and east and west, the crowded roadways go, and sweating brow and weary breast are all they seem to know. And mad for pleasure, some are bent, and some are seeking fame, and some are sick with discontent, and some are bruised and lame. Across the world the gleaming steel holds out its lure for men, but no one finds his comfort real till he comes home again. And chartered lanes now line the sea for weary hearts to roam. But, oh, the finest path to me is that which leads to home. Tis there I come to laughing eyes and find a welcome true. Tis there all care behind me lies and joy is ever new. And, oh, when every day is done upon that little street, a pair of rosy youngsters run to me with flying feet. The world with myriad paths is lined, but one alone for me, one little road where I may find the charms I want to see. Though thoroughfares majestic call the multitude to roam, I would not leave to know them all the path that leads to home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The March into Virginia, ending in the First Manassas, July, 1861, by Herman Melville. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Did all the lets and bars appear, to every just or larger end, whence should come the trust and cheer? Youth must its ignorant impulse lend. Age finds place in the rear. All wars are boyish, and are fought by boys. 
the champions and enthusiasts of the state, turbid ardors and vain joys, not barrenly abate, stimulants to the power mature, preparatives of fate. Who here forecasteth the event? What heart but spurns at precedent, and warnings of the wise, condemned foreclosures of surprise? The banners played, the bugles call, the air is blue and prodigal. No burying party pleasure wooed, no picnic party in the May. Ever went less loath than they, into that leafy neighborhood. In Bacchic glee they filed toward fate, Moloch's uninitiate, expectancy, and glad surmise of battle's unknown mysteries. All they feel is this, tis glory, a rapture sharp, though transitory, yet lasting in belaureled story. So they gaily go to fight, chatting left and laughing right, but some who this blithe mood present, as on in lightsome files they fare shall die experienced ere three days are spent perish enlightened by the volleyed glare or shame survive and like to adamant the throw of second manassas share end of poem this recording is in the public domain Whoever you are holding me now in hand by Walt Whitman This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Whoever you are holding me now in hand, without one thing all will be useless. I give you fair warning before you attempt me further. I am not what you supposed, but far different. Who is he that would become my follower? who would sign himself a candidate for my affections. The way is suspicious, the result uncertain, perhaps destructive. You would have to give up all else. I alone would expect to be your sole and exclusive standard. Your novitiate would even then be long and exhausting. The whole past theory of your life, and all conformity to the lives around you, would have to be abandoned. Therefore release me now before troubling yourself any further. Let go your hand from my shoulders. Put me down and depart on your way. Or else by stealth in some wood for trial, or back of a rock in the open air, for in any roof room of a house I emerge not, nor in company, and in libraries I lie as one dumb, a gawk, or unborn, or dead but just possibly with you on a high hill, first watching lest any person for miles around approaches unawares, or possibly with you sailing at sea, or on the beach of the sea, or some quiet island, here to put your lips upon mine, I permit you, with the comrade's long-dwelling kiss, or the new husband's kiss, for I am the new husband, and I am the comrade. Or if you will, thrusting me beneath your clothing, where I may feel the throbs of your heart, or rest upon your hip. Carry me when you go forth over land or sea, for thus merely touching you is enough, is best. And thus touching you would I silently sleep and be carried eternally. But these leaves conning you con at peril, for these leaves and me you will not understand. They will elude you at first, and still more afterward, I will certainly elude you. Even while you should think you had unquestionably caught me, behold, already you see I have escaped from you. For it is not for what I have put into it that I have written this book, nor is it by reading it you will acquire it, nor do those know me best who admire me and vauntingly praise me nor will the candidates for my love, unless at most of very few, prove victorious, nor will my poems do good only, they will do just as much evil, perhaps more, for all is useless without that which you may guess at many times, and not hit that which I hinted at, therefore release me, and depart on your way. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. May by Helen Hunt Jackson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. O oh, month when they who love must love and wed, Were one to go to worlds where May is not, And seek to tell the memories he had brought From earth of thee, what were most fitly said. I know not if the rosy showers shed From apple boughs, or if the soft green wrought in fields, Or if the robin's call be fraught the most with thy delight. Perhaps they read thee best who in the ancient time did say, Thou wert the sacred month unto the old. No blossom blooms upon thy brightest day, So subtly sweet as memories which enfold, In aged hearts which in thy sunshine lie, To sun themselves once more before they die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Swinney Among the Nightingales by T. S. Eliot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Ape neck Sweeney spreads his knees, letting his arms hang down to laugh. The zebra stripes along his jaw, swelling to maculate giraffe. The circles of the stormy moon slide westward toward the river plate. Death and the raven drift above, and Sweeney guards the horned gate. Gloomy Orion and the dog are veiled and hushed the shrunken seas. The person in the Spanish cape tries to sit on Sweeney's knees, slips and pulls the tablecloth, overturns a coffee cup, reorganized upon the floor, she yawns and draws a stocking up. The silent man in mocha brown sprawls at the window sill and gapes. The waiter brings in oranges, bananas, figs, and hothouse grapes. The silent vertebrate in brown contracts and concentrates, withdraws. Rachel ni Rabinovich tears at the grapes with murderous paws. She and the lady in the cape are suspect, thought to be in league. Therefore the man with heavy eyes declines the gambit, shows fatigue. Leaves the room and reappears outside the window, leaning in. Branches of wisteria circumscribe a golden grin. The host, with someone indistinct, converses at the door apart. The nightingales are singing near the convent of the sacred heart, and sang within the bloody wood when Agamemnon cried aloud, and let their liquid droppings fall to stain the stiff, dishonored shroud. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Late Walk by Robert Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. When I go up through the mowing field, the headless aftermath, smooth laid like thatch with the heavy dew, half closes the garden path. And when I come to the garden ground, the whir of sober birds up from the tangle of withered weeds is sadder than any words. A tree beside the wall stands bare, but a leaf that lingered brown, disturbed, I doubt not by my thought, comes softly rattling down. I end not far from my going forth by picking the faded blue of the last remaining aster flower to carry again to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sheltered Garden by H.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. I have had enough. I gasp for breath. 
Every way ends, every road, every footpath leads at last to the hill crest. Then you retrace your steps, or find the same slope on the other side. Precipitate. I have had enough. Border pinks, clove pinks, wax lilies, herbs, sweet cress. Oh, for some sharp swish of a branch. There is no scent of resin in this place, no taste of bark, of coarse weeds, aromatic, astringent, only border on border of scented pinks. Have you seen fruit under cover that wanted light? Pears, wadded in cloth, protected from the frost, melons, almost ripe, smothered in straw. Why not let the pears cling to the empty branch? All your coaxing will only make a bitter fruit. Let them cling, ripen of themselves, test their own worth, nipped, shriveled by the frost, to fall at last, but fair, with a russet coat. Or the melon, let it bleached yellow in the winter light, even tart to the taste. It is better to taste of frost, the exquisite frost, than of wadding and of dead grass. For this beauty, beauty without strength, chokes out life. I want wind to break. Scatter these pink stalks, snap off their spiced heads, fling them about with dead leaves, spread the paths with twigs, limbs broken off, trail great pine branches hurled from some far wood right across the melon patch, break pear and quince, leave half trees, torn, twisted, but showing the fight was valiant. Oh, to blot out this garden, to forget, to find a new beauty in some terrible, wind-tortured place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pauline Barrett by Edgar Lee Masters This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife, and almost a year to creep back into strength, till the dawn of our wedding decennial found me my seeming self again. We walked the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes, and you could not look in my eyes, for such sorrow was ours, the beginning of grey in your hair, and I but a shell of myself. And what did we talk of? Sky and water, anything, most, to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses set on the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. Then my spirit drooped as the night came on, and you left me alone in my room for a while, as you did when I was a bride. Poor heart. And I looked in the mirror, and something said, One should be all dead when one is half dead, nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it, looking there in the mirror, Dear, have you ever understood? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Springfield Magical by Vachel Lindsay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. In this city, the city of my discontent, sometimes there comes a whisper from the grass, Romance, romance is here, no Hindu town is quite so strange, no citadel of brass, by Sinbad found, held half such love and hate, no picture palace and a picture book, such webs of friendship, beauty, greed, and fate. In this, the city of my discontent, down from the sky, up from the smoking deep, Wild legends new and old burn round my bed, While trees and grass and men are wrapped in sleep. Angels come down, with Christmas in their hearts, Gentle, whimsical, laughing, heaven-sent, And for a day fair peace have given me, In this the city of my discontent. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnets by Edna St. Vincent Millay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. 1. Thou art not lovelier than lilacs, no, nor honeysuckle. Thou art no more fair than small white single poppies. I can bear thy beauty, though I bend before thee. Though from left to right, not knowing where to go, I turn my troubled eyes, nor here nor there, find any refuge from thee. Yet I swear, so has it been with mist, with moonlight so. Like him who day by day, and to his drought, of delicate poison, adds him one drop more, till he may drink unharmed the death of ten. Even so, inured to beauty, who have quaffed each hour more deeply than the hour before, I drink and live what has destroyed some men. 2. Time does not bring relief. You all have lied. Who told me time would ease me of my pain? I miss him in the weeping of the rain. I want him at the shrinking of the tide. The old snows melt from every mountain side, and last year's leaves are smoke in every lane. But last year's bitter loving must remain, heaped on my heart, and my old thoughts abide. There are a hundred places where I fear to go, so with his memory they brim, and entering with relief some quiet place where never fell his foot or shone his face. I say, there is no memory of him here, and so stand stricken, so remembering him. 3. Mindful of you the sodden earth and spring, and all the flowers that in the springtime grow, and dusty roads, and thistles, and the slow rising of the round moon, all throats that sing the summer through, and each departing wing, and all the nests that the bared branches show, and all winds that in any weather blow, and all the storms that the four seasons bring. You go no more on your exultant feet, up paths that only mist in morning knew, or watch the wind, or listen to the beat of a bird's wings too high in air to view. But you were something more than young and sweet, and fair, and the young year remembers you. Four. Not in this chamber, only at my birth, when the long hours of that mysterious night were over, and the morning was in sight. I cried, but in strange places, step and firth, I have not seen, through alien grief and mirth, and never shall one room contain me quite, who, in so many rooms, first saw the light, child of all mothers, native of the earth. So is no warmth for me at any fire to-day, when the world's fire has burned so low. I kneel, spending my breath in vain desire, at that cold hearth which one time roared so strong, and straightened back in weariness, and longed to gather up my little gods and go. 5. If I should learn, in some quite casual way, that you were gone, not to return again, Read from the back page of a paper, say, held by a neighbor in a subway train, how at the corner of this avenue, and such a street, so are the papers filled, a hurrying man, who happened to be you, at noon to-day, had happened to be killed. I should not cry aloud, I could not cry aloud, or wring my hands in such a place. I should but watch the station lights rush by, with a more careful interest on my face, or raise my eyes, and read with greater care, where to store furs, and how to treat the hair. End of poems. This recording is in the public domain. Manhattan by Lola Ridge This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times
Out of the night you burn, Manhattan, in a vesture of gold, span of innumerable arcs, flaring and multiplying, gold at the uttermost circles fading into the tenderest hint of jade, or fusing in tremulous twilight blues, robing the far-flung offices, scintillant storied forking flame, or soaring to luminous amethyst over the steeples, aureolate, diaphanous gold, veiling the Woolworth, argently rising slender and stark, mellifluous shrill as a vendor's cry, and towers squatting graven and cold on the velvet bales of the dark, and the singers appraising indolent idol's eye, and night like a purple cloth unrolled, nebulous gold, throwing an ephemeral glory about life's vanishing points, wherein you burn, you of unknown voltage, whirling on your axis, scrawling vermilion signatures over the night's velvet hoarding, insolent, towering, spherical, to a pieces ever shifting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ships That Pass in the Night by Paul Lawrence Dunbar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Out in the sky the great dark clouds are massing. I look far out into the pregnant night, where I can hear a solemn booming gun and catch the gleaming of a random light that tells me that the ship I seek is passing, passing. My tearful eyes, my soul's deep hurt, are glassing. For I would hail and check that ship of ships. I stretch my hands, imploring, cry aloud. My voice falls deep a foot from mine own lips, and but its ghost doth reach that vessel, passing, passing. O earth, O sky, O ocean, both surpassing, O heart of mine, O soul that dreads the dark. Is there no hope for me? Is there no way that I may sight and check that speeding bark, which out of sight and sound is passing, passing? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Black and Unknown Bards by James Weldon Johnson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times O Black and Unknown Bards of Long Ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How, in your darkness, did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes, who first from out the still watch, lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark-kept soul, burst into song? Heart of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus, on its strains his spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. Who heard great Jordan roll, whose starward eye saw chariot swing low? And who was he that breathed that comforting, melodic sigh? Nobody knows to trouble I see. What merely living clod, what captive thing, could up toward God through all its darkness grope? and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith, and hope. How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music heard not with the ears? How sound the elusive reed, so seldom blown, which stirs the soul, or melts the heart to tears? Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies, that thundered amongst the stars at the creation, ever heard a theme nobler than go down moses mark its bars how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds such tones there were that helped make history when time was young there is a wide wide wonder in it all 
that from degraded rest and servile toil the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil o black slave singers gone forgot unfamed you you alone of all the long long line of those who've sung untaught unknown unnamed have stretched out upward seeking the divine you sang not deeds of heroes or of kings no chant of bloody war no exulting pen of arms won triumphs but your humble strings you touched in chord with music empyrean you sang far better than you knew the songs that for your listeners hungry hearts sufficed still live but more than this to you belongs you sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Heart of a Woman by Georgia Douglas Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. The heart of a woman goes forth with the dawn, As a lone bird, soft-winging, so restlessly on. Afar o'er life's turrets and veils does it roam, In the wake of those echoes a heart calls home. The heart of a woman falls back with the night, And enters some alien cage in its plight, And tries to forget it has dreamed of the stars, While it breaks, breaks, breaks on the sheltering bars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Translation by Anne Spencer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. We trekked into a far country, my friend and I. Our deeper content was never spoken, but each knew all the other said. He told me how calm his soul was laid by the lack of anvil and strife. The wooing kestrel, I said, mutes his mating note to please the harmony of this sweet silence. And when all the day's end we laid tired bodies against the loose warm sands, and the air fleeced its particles for a coverlet, when star after star came out to guard their lovers in oblivion, my soul so leapt that my evening prayer stole my morning song. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Queen Anne's Lace by William Carlos Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Her body is not so white as anemone petals, nor so smooth, nor so remote a thing. It is a field of the wild carrot taking the field by force. The grass does not raise above it. Here is no question of whiteness, white as can be, with a purple mole at the center of each flower. Each flower is a hand spanned of her whiteness. Wherever his hand has lain, there is a tiny purple blossom under his touch, to which the fibers of her being stem one by one, each to its end, until the whole field is a white desire, empty, a single stem, a cluster, flower by flower, a pious wish to whiteness, gone over, or nothing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wild Peaches by Eleanor Wiley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. One. When the world turns completely upside down, you say we'll immigrate to the eastern shore, aboard a river boat, from Baltimore, we'll live among wild peach trees, miles from town. 
You'll wear a coonskin cap and I a gown. Homespun, dyed butternut's dark gold color, lost like your lotus-eating ancestor. We'll swim in milk and honey till we drown. The winter will be short, the summer long, the autumn amber-hued, sunny and hot, tasting of cider and of scuppernong, all seasons sweet, but autumn best of all. The squirrels and their silver fur will fall, like falling leaves, like fruit, before your shot. 2. The autumn frosts will lie upon the grass, like bloom on grapes of purple, brown, and gold. The misted early mornings will be cold, the little puddles will be rooted with glass. The sun, which burns from copper into brass, melts these at noon, and makes the boys unfold their knitted mufflers full as they can hold. Fat pockets dribble chestnuts as they pass. Peaches grow wild, and pigs can live in clover. A barrel of salted herrings lasts a year. The spring begins before the winter's over. By February you may find the skins of garter snakes and water moccasins, dwindled and harsh, dead white and cloudy clear. 3. When April pours the colors of a shell upon the hills, when every little creek is shot with silver from the Chesapeake, in shoals new minted by the ocean swell, when strawberries go begging, and the sleek blue plums lie open to the blackbird's beak, we shall live well, we shall live very well. The months between the cherries and the peaches are brimming cornucopias, which spill fruits red and purple, somber bloomed and black. Then, down rich fields and frosty river beaches, we'll trample bright persimmons, while we kill bronze partridge, speckled quail, and canvas back. 4. Down to the Puritan marrow of my bones, there's something in this richness that I hate. I love the look, austere, immaculate, of landscapes drawn in pearly monotones. There's something in my very blood that owns bare hills, cold silver on a sky of slate, a thread of water churned to milky spate, streaming through slanted pastures fenced with stones. I love those skies, thin blue or snowy gray, those fields sparse planted, rendering meager sheaves, that spring briefer than apple blossom's breath, summer so much too beautiful to stay, swift autumn, like a bonfire of leaves, and sleepy winter, like the sleep of death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring Night by Sarah Teasdale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. The park is filled with night and fog. The veils are drawn about the world. The drowsy lights along the paths are dim and pearled. Golden gleaming the empty streets. Golden gleaming the misty lake. The mirrored lights like sunken swords glimmer and shake. Oh! Is it not enough to be here with this beauty over me? My throat should ache with praise, and I should kneel in joy beneath the sky. O oh, beauty, are you not enough? Why am I crying after love? With youth, a singing voice, and eyes to take earth's wonder with surprise. Why have I put off my pride? Why am I unsatisfied? I, for whom the pensive night binds her cloudy hair with light. I, for whom all beauty burns, like incense in a million urns. O oh, beauty, are you not enough? Why am I crying after love? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mourn Not the Dead by Ralph Chaplin this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Mourn not the dead that in the cool earth lie, dust unto dust. The calm sweet earth that mothers all who die, as all men must. Mourn not your captive comrades who must dwell, too strong to strive. Within each steel-bound coffin of a cell, buried alive. But rather mourn the apathetic throng, the cowed and the meek, who see the world's great anguish and its wrong, and dare not speak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem 12 by Ezra Pound from Hugh Selwyn Mauberly, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Daphne, with her thighs and bark, stretches toward me her leafy hands. Subjectively, in the stuffed satin drawing room, I await the Lady Valentine's commands. Knowing my coat has never been of precisely the fashion to stimulate in her a durable passion, doubtful somewhat of the value of well-gowned approbation, of literary effort, but never of the Lady Valentine's vocation. Poetry, her border of ideas, the edge uncertain, but a means of blending with other strata, where the lower and higher have ending. A hook to catch the Lady Jane's attention, a modulation toward the theater. Also in the case of revolution, a possible friend and comforter. Conduct, on the other hand, the soul which the highest cultures have nourished to Fleet Street where Dr. Johnson flourished. Beside this thoroughfare, the sale of half-hose has long since superseded the cultivation of Pyrian roses. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Reformers, A Hymn of Hate by Dorothy Parker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times I hate reformers. They raise my blood pressure. They are the prohibitionists, the fathers of bootlegging. They made us what we are today. I hope they're satisfied. They can prove that the Johnstown flood and the blizzard of 1888 and the destruction of Pompeii were all due to alcohol. They have figured it out, that anyone who would give a gin daisy a friendly look is just wasting his time out of jail, and anyone who would stay under the same roof with a bottle of scotch is right in line for a cozy seat in the electric chair. They fix things all up pretty for us. Now that they have dried up the country, you can hardly get a drink unless you go in and order one. They are in a nasty state over this light wines and beer idea. They say that lips that touch liquor shall never touch wine. They swear that the Eighteenth Amendment shall be improved upon. Over their dead bodies, fair enough. Then there are the suppressors of vice, the boys who made the name of cable a household word. Their aim is to keep art and letters in their place. If they see a book, which does not come right out and say that the doctor brings babies in his little black bag, or find a painting of a young lady showing her without her rubbers, they call out the militia. They have a mean eye for dirt. They can find it. In a copy of What Katie Did at School, or a snapshot of Aunt Bessie in Bathing at Sandy Creek or a picture postcard of moonlight in Bryant Park. They are always running around suppressing things, beginning with their desires. They get a lot of excitement out of life. They are constantly discovering the new Rabelais, or the twentieth-century Hogarth. Their leader is regarded as the representative of Comstock here on earth. How does that song of Tosti's go? 
Good-bye, Sumner. Good-bye, good-bye. There are the movie censors. The motion picture is still in its infancy. They are the boys who keep it there. If the film shows a party of clubmen tossing off ginger ale, or a young bride dreaming over tiny garments, or Douglas Fairbanks kissing Mary Pickford's hand, they cut out the scene, and burn it in the public square. They fix up all the historical events, so that their own mothers wouldn't know them. They make Du Barry Mrs. Louis Fifteenth, and show that Anthony and Cleopatra were like brother and sister, and announce Salome's engagement to John the Baptist, so that the audience won't go and get ideas in their heads. They insist that Sherlock Holmes is made to say, Quick, Watson, the crochet needle, and the state pays them for it. They say they are going to take the sin out of cinema. If they perish in the attempt, I wish to God they would. And then there are the all-American crabs, the brave little band that is against everything. They have got up the idea that things are not what they were when Grandma was a girl. They say they don't know what we're coming to, as if they had just written the line. They are always running a temperature over the modern dances, or the new skirts, or the goings-on of the younger set. They can barely hold themselves in when they think of the menace of the drama. They seem to be going ahead under the idea that everything but the passion play was written by Avery Hopwood. They will never feel really themselves until every theater in the country is raised. They are forever signing petitions, urging that cigarette smokers should be deported, and that all places of amusement should be closed on Sunday, and kept closed all week. They take everything personally. They go about shaking their heads, and sighing, It's all wrong! It's all wrong! They said it. I hate reformers. They raise my blood pressure. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lilacs by Amy Lowell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Lilacs, false blue, white, purple, color of lilac, your great puffs of flowers are everywhere in this, my New England. Among your heart-shaped leaves, orange orioles hop like music-box birds and sing their little weak soft songs in the crooks of your branches. The bright eyes of song-sparrows sitting on spotted eggs peer restlessly through the light and shadow of all springs. Lilacs in dooryards, holding quiet conversations with an early moon. Lilacs watching a deserted house, settling sideways into the grass of an old road. Lilacs, wind-beaten, staggering under a lopsided shock of bloom above a cellar dug into a hill. You are everywhere. You were everywhere. You tapped the window when the preacher preached his sermon, and ran along the road beside the boy going to school. You stood by pasture bars to give the cows good milking. You persuaded the housewife that her dishpan was of silver, and her husband an image of pure gold. You flaunted the fragrance of your blossoms through the wide doors of custom houses. You, and sandalwood, and tea, charging the noses of quill-driving clerks. When a ship was in from China, you called to them, Goose-quill men, goose-quill men, May is the month for flitting, until they writhed on their high stools and wrote poetry on their letter-sheets behind the propped-up ledgers. Paradoxical New England clerks, writing inventories and ledgers, reading the Song of Solomon at night. So many verses before bedtime. Because it was the Bible, the dead fed you amid the slant stones of graveyards. Pale ghosts who planted you came in the night-time, and let their thin hair blow through your clustered stems. You are of the green sea and of the stone hills which reach a long distance. You are of elm-shaded streets with little shops where they sell kites and marbles. You are of great parks where everyone walks and nobody is at home. 
you cover the blind sides of greenhouses and lean over the top to say a hurry word through the glass to your friends the grapes inside lilacs false blue white purple color of lilac you have forgotten your eastern origin the veiled women with eyes like panthers the swollen aggressive turbans of jeweled pashas now you are a very decent flower a reticent flower a curiously clear-cut candid flower standing beside clean doorways friendly to a house cat and a pair of spectacles making poetry out of a bit of moonlight and a hundred or two sharp blossoms maine knows you has for years and years new hampshire knows you and massachusetts and vermont cape cod starts you along the beaches to rhode island connecticut takes you from a river to the sea you are brighter than apples sweeter than tulips you are the great flood of our souls bursting above the leaf shapes of our hearts you are the smell of all summers the love of wives and children the recollection of the gardens of little children you are state houses and charters and the familiar treading of the foot to and fro on a road it knows may is lilac here in new england may is a thrush singing sun up on a tip-top ash tree may is white clouds behind pine trees puffed out and marching upon a blue sky may is a green as no other may is much sun through small leaves may is soft earth and apple blossoms and windows open to a south wind may is a full light wind of lilac from canada to narragansett bay lilacs false blue white purple color of lilac heart leaves of lilac all over new england roots of lilac under all the soil of new england lilac in me because i am new england because my roots are in it because my leaves are of it because my flowers are for it because it is my country and i speak to it of itself and sing of it with my own voice since certainly it is mine end of poem this recording is in the public domain Tetelestai by Conrad Aiken. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. How shall we praise the magnificence of the dead? The great man humbled, the haughty brought to dust. Is there a horn we should not blow as proudly for the meanest of us all who creeps his days? guarding his heart from blows to die obscurely i am no king have laid no kingdoms waste taken no princes captive led no triumphs of weeping women through long walls of trumpets say rather i am no one or an atom say rather two great gods in a vault of starlight play ponderingly at chess and at the game's end one of the pieces shaken falls to the floor and runs to the darkest corner and that piece forgotten there left motionless is i say that i have no name no gifts no power am only one of millions mostly silent one who came with lips and hand and a heart looked on beauty and loved it and then left it say that the fates of time and space obscured me led me a thousand ways to pain bemuse me wrap me in ugliness and like great spiders dispatch me at their leisure well what then should i not hear as i lie down in dust the horns of glory blowing above my burial two morning and evening opened and closed above me houses were built above me trees let fall yellowing leaves upon me hands of ghosts rain has showered its arrows of silver upon me seeking my heart winds have roared and tossed me 
Music in long blue waves of sound has borne me, a helpless weed, to shores of unthought silence. Time above me, within me, crashed its gongs of terrible warning, sifting the dust of death. And here I lie. Blow now your horns of glory harshly over my flesh. You trees, you waters, you stars and suns, Canopus, Deneb, Rigel, let me, as I lie down, here in this dust, hear, far off, your whispered salutation. Roar now above my decaying flesh, you winds. Whirl out your earth scents over this body. Tell me of ferns and stagnant pools, wild roses, hillsides. Anoint me, rain. Let crash your silver arrows on this hard flesh. I am the one who named you. I lived in you, and now I die in you. I, your son, your daughter, treader of music, lie broken, conquered. Let me not fall in silence. 3. I, the restless one, the circler of circles, herdsman and roper of stars, who could not capture the secret of self, I, who was tyrant to weaklings, striker of children, destroyer of women, corrupter of innocent dreamers, and laugher at beauty. I, too easily, brought to tears and weakness by music, baffled and broken by love, the helpless beholder of the war in my heart of desire with desire, the struggle of hatred with love, terror with hunger. I, who laughed without knowing the cause of my laughter, who grew without wishing to grow, a servant to my own body, loved without reason the laughter and flesh of a woman, enduring such torments to find her, I, who at last grow weaker, struggle more feebly, relent in my purpose, choose for my triumph an easier end, look backward at earlier conquests, or, caught in the web, cry out in a sudden and empty despair. Tetelestai, pity me now. I, who was arrogant, beg you, tell me as I lie down that I was courageous. Blow horns of victory now, as I reel and am vanquished. Shatter the sky with trumpets above my grave. 4. Look, this flesh, how it crumbles to dust, and is blown. These bones, how they grind in the granite, of frost, and are nothing. This skull, how it yawns for a flicker of time in the darkness, yet laughs not, and sees not. It is crushed by a hammer of sunlight, and the hands are destroyed. Press down through the leaves of the jasmine. Dig through the interlaced roots. Never more will you find me. I was no better than dust, yet you cannot replace me. Take the soft dust in your hand. Does it stir? Does it sing? Has it lips and a heart? Does it open its eyes to the sun? Does it run? Does it dream? Does it burn with a secret, or tremble in terror of death? Or ache with tremendous decisions? Listen. It says, I lean by the river. The willows are yellowed with bud. White clouds roar up from the south and darken the ripples, but they cannot darken my heart, nor the face like a star in my heart. Rain falls on the water, and pelts it, and rings it with silver. The willow trees glisten, the sparrows chirp under the eaves, but the face in my heart is a secret of music. I wait in the rain and am silent. Listen again, it says, I have worked, I am tired. The pencil dulls in my hand. I see through the window walls upon walls of windows with faces behind them, smoke floating up to the sky, an ascension of seagulls. I am tired. I have struggled in vain. My decision was fruitless. Why, then, do I wait, with darkness so easy at hand? But to-morrow, perhaps, I will wait and endure till to-morrow. Or again, it is dark. The decision is made. I am vanquished by terror of life. The walls mount slowly about me in coldness. I had not the courage. I was forsaken. 
I cried out, was answered by silence. Tetelestai. Five. Hear how it babbles. Blow the dust out of your hand. With its voices and visions, tread on it. Forget it. Turn homeward with dreams in your brain. This, then, is the humble, the nameless, the lover, the husband and father, the struggler with shadows, the one who went down under shoutings of chaos, the weakling who cried his forsaken like Christ on the darkening hilltop. This, then, is the one who implores, as he dwindles to silence, a fanfare of glory, and which of us dares to deny him? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.